So Acts 12, 18 to 25. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace, because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an or oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give glory, God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark, John Mark. So Satan was seeking to defeat the early church. He was seeking to distract them, to discourage them, to harm them. But God, but God, right? Peter escapes by God's power. Now, Peter will only be mentioned one other time in the book of Acts. He kind of goes into obscurity in a way at this point. He's not mentioned again until Acts chapter 15. That's about six years later at a general church council where he is there about eh, somewhere around 80, 50, 80, 49, something like that. But the guards then, uh, we, we just heard, you know, the guards, well, they're perplexed. Herod's a little perplexed. He's not sure what happened, right? No one can really explain it. And so the guards are punished. They are put to death. Good morning, Carol. They're punished, and, and Herod claims to be the divine and would die by God's hand. Yet God's word grew and multiplied. You know, one theologian put it this way, the prosperity, not financial, but the prosperity and progress of the church are assured when she finds her victories through faith in her glorified head of Jesus Christ. That our victories as believers are assured when we find our victory and our glory only in Jesus Christ. No one else could get the victory for Peter walking out of that prison but God. Only God could find that victory. But what a twist of tales, right? A, a twist of tales. Herod was in power and now dead. Peter, almost dead, now freed only by the hand of God. You know, I, I don't know what it is that you're going through right now. You know, there's been a lot that's been on our family um, in, in the last few weeks and, uh, and, and more yet to come. And I don't know what it is, but we find victory. I had an individual at our Night to Shine come up to me and he goes, you know, Pastors sometimes need a word, and, I, and I, I have this word that I felt that I needed to give you. He is involved in his church and things, and, and he goes, uh, I, you know, he doesn't really know us. And he goes, but pastor, there's a great trial about to become. In the midst of some wonderful things that are going on, there will be a trial to test, but remain strong in the Lord. I don't like hearing that, right? But yet there's a promise in it to remain strong in the Lord through it, through the desert, through those dark times, through the dark nights of the soul. When we trust God and we see that those great victories come when only God can show up and show off in our family, in our situations, in our church, in our homes. Herod, oh, by the way, we, we see historically a little bit more, so Josephus writes more about the details of his death. He was flattered by his subjects. They called him a god. They called him divine. They worshipped him. He wasn't the emperor. Emperor worship was a, a, a thing in those days. They would treat them as if they were gods. But not Herod. Not these tetriarchs. These 
local kings that were under the Roman ruler. No, they didn't claim to be gods. But Herod was flattered by these people and called a god, and he accepted the worship and the praise. He stole God's worship. It's the one thing God will not allow. He stole the praise and honor that was due only to him, to God. Here's another part of this. His subjects, King Herod, who he ruled over, they were Jews. It was the Jewish nation. He was ruling over the Jews. Their apostasy had gone so far, they no longer are even mentioned in Scripture by their, by their holy tribal name. They are now said to be just subjects, that the subjects stood up and worshipped, and that under the complete control of an earthly king now, who they now worshipped as God. Do you see the depth of the rebellion? Do you see the complete rebellion that has taken place, the complete uh, apostasy that has taken place turning from God? I mean, remember all the way back to 1 Samuel 8, and, and at that time, Israel says, we want a king. Why did they want a king? They wanted a king because the other nations had one, and it would legitimize them. They would be a real nation now, not a nation under God, right? We can claim that, but we aren't. We are a nation under a ruler. We are a nation under whatever uh, ruling power, right? We are a nation under a king. Israel wanted to be a nation under a king. And Samuel, oh, he said, why do you no longer trust God? God who has led you, God who has guided you, God who has protected you, saved you, everything, and yet they no longer trusted God. They wanted to be legitimate. They wanted to be politically correct. They wanted to be, well, seen in the political world as a value. And Samuel even then warned them when they turned their hearts to an earthly king that that king would do some major things over them, that would rule it over them, tax them, uh, all kinds of things. Yet they still demanded it. Blinded by the world around them, the world had seeped in. And now their hearts have turned so full circle away from God that they not just are in rebellion, but complete denial of and worshiping this king as if he is their God, their Savior, their Lord. Can I tell you, I don't care if it's Republican, Democrat, Independent, when we worship a president as if they are the Savior of this nation, we as believers have become apostate to God. We don't like hearing that. You know, that's the one thing that I, I could preach all the theology I want and preach it completely wrong and people won't leave. But if I preach anything political, oh, they get up and leave. I could tell you of six individuals in the last five years who specifically have left. Some have thought I was too liberal. Some thought I was too conservative. I Because they didn't know. They allowed their emotions to overrule when really the issue is I'm too biblical. It overseeds. Does that mean we don't vote? Absolutely. It means we vote. We vote our conscience. We are called to be a part of, but we do not find our salvation in the rulers around us. No one will fix our economy. No one will fix what is ailing except for Jesus Christ. We as believers ought to be the ones to stand up proclaiming that more and more and more. But like Israel, they had begun to allow their worship to be given to an earthly king. And they would find judgment, the final judgment of God on Israel because they denied and stole the worship from God. You see, God guides those who follow him wholeheartedly. You know, the message of holiness is a 
holistic message. Now, I'm not just talking, okay, creation and being good, eco-friendly people. I mean, okay, that's part of it too. I, I'm not just talking about being pro-life. That's a part of it too. I'm not just, you know, talking about, you know, reading our Bible. That's part of it. But the holistic gospel changes us emotionally, spiritually, and physically. It changes the world around us, the atmosphere around us. We bring heaven on earth when we are truly wholeheartedly following after God. He wants to redeem us. Things like deliverance ministries and soul care. I was talking with one on Wednesday, an individual that leads kind of the soul care ministry. And I said, you realize if we would truly follow after God, if we would put the disciplines and practices in place to right our emotions before the throne of God, to sit in the furnace that is the desert, the solitude, the silence, so as to hear from God, we would not have the issues that we have in this world. Anxieties and fears and worries the devil on our shoulder that speaks into our minds. But because we live in a fallen state, it is there. But by the grace of God, we don't have to succumb to it. We don't have to begin to turn our hearts into worshiping things of this world versus the things of God. God guides those who follow him wholeheartedly. When we join him in victory, those who follow God, even at great cost to ourselves. This should be a reminder to us. There is a day that is coming. There is a day that is coming where God will call all accounts to order. He will judge us all, and he will restore all things. He will restore all believers, and he will rid his creation of all who have chosen darkness. It's that eternal punishment of hell. He will put all wrongs right. That's why we can forgive, as we talked about on Sunday. We can forgive because it's not on us to make things right. It's not on us to withhold forgiveness so that someone is truly repentant and learns. It is on us to show grace and mercy even in the midst of their mis not understanding it. There is a day coming when God will hold, call us all to accounts. All. There, there's a bad theology that goes around the church that talks about multiple judgment seats. Scripture does not describe multiple judgment seats. We talked about that in Revelation. There is one. It is appointed unto man wants to die in the judgment. The judgment. There is a judgment where we will stand before God. The sheep and the goats. Those who receive the reward and those who do not. Often we have used this idea of a Bema judgment that we as believers won't have to stand and be held accountable for our misdeeds, our wrongs. We will. Now, it is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, but we will still be called into account. The question is not the account. The question is, will Jesus stand up and say, yes, this is my child. I have paid that penalty. The blood was applied. Josephus described that Herod... He had stood up, he had stood among this crowd, and he had put on a special robe. It was a gorgeous silver robe, is how Joseph, uh, Josephus described it. And it was designed especially to reflect the sun. 
and he stood on such a platform facing the sun so that when the people looked on him, his garments would shine and he would glow as if he were divine. Not only did he accept worship, he manipulated it. He not only called himself divine, he sought to fake the divinity. It was designed to reflect the sun, making it look like he was shining as if he was God. And God would not share his glory. And Herod was called to account and died that day. God's glory was revealed in Jesus to all of us, not to Herod. Herod, though, helped reveal God's power and his power to judge. When we reach that point that we have gone so far to begin to take God's glory from him, the judgment is swift. God's power would shine and his mission would go out in spite of this mission that we begin to see will begin. As we move on into this next section to chapter 13, we see the sending out of the church that would begin to take place. The strong multiplication that would happen. And the glory of God that would be revealed as people begin to experience him more and more. So God, I pray that in everything we do, everything we say, every way we act, we would be a people revealing your glory, not stealing it. We would be a people shining to you, not ourselves. That we would be a people, as we talked on Sunday, that are so aware of the debt that they owed that they could never repay that we will forgive doesn't mean they come back into that same toleration. It doesn't mean that they come back into the same place of, uh, of responsibility and authority in our lives. They no longer control us. That we can see them without ill. We could greet them. That we could pray for their blessing Pray for their well-being. Pray good things, not harm. But God, that only comes through your strength. May we be a people that shine your light, not ours. And our weaknesses be strong, O oh God. We'll give you all the praise, all the glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. We'll go.